The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise now for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening in our reading from Romans chapter 12, very first verse said this, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So that's what we want to be thinking about this evening. What does it mean to offer your body as a living sacrifice? As we think about that, I want to do it with three facets of the sacrificial life, especially in mind as we see it described here in Romans. And first of all, that this life of a living sacrifice is going to be a life, obviously, of worship. And, and secondly, that the life of a living sacrifice is going to be a life of nonconformity. So it's, it's a life that is not shaped by the pressures and the influences of the sinful world, but rather this is a life that is made possible by God who's transforming it which leads to three, and that is that the life of a living sacrifice is not a life that is lived in our own power, but it's really a life that is lived in the power of God's mercy. So those are the three things. Let's dig a little deeper into each one of these aspects, beginning first of all with this, that in calling us to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices, 
verse 1 defines that as spiritual worship. Well, of course, the very word sacrifice comes from the, the whole notion of worship, doesn't it? You think back to the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the worship of Israel, then you might even think about some of those animals that were offered as sacrifices and the lambs and the, and the rams and the bulls and so on. Now, obviously, those animals that were offered in sacrifice didn't have any will in that matter. It wasn't their choice, but rather they were brought as sacrifices and their, uh, their bodies were put to death and the fire of the altar consumed what was offered. In contrast, here's what we're told. We're to be willing sacrifices. We're not simply bringing, you know, some animal, but rather we are bringing our very selves. We're willingly offering up ourselves to God. Now, verse 1 says, offer your bodies. Probably we should not think strictly of our body here, but really we should think of our, our whole self, everything that has to do with our life in this world, which of course includes everything that we do with our bodies. But what God wants us to view everything now in life as a continuous act of worship. Another passage that comes right along with that is the one that we find in Ephesians 3, where it says that whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So, so that's everything in life, not just what we're doing here tonight, not just a, an hour of worship together. When we offer up to God our praise, our hymns, our prayers, as we hear from his word, as we give to him our offerings and so on, that's a part of it. But this is much more than that. This is about being devoted to God in every aspect of your life. C.F.W. Walther says it like this. He says it means killing every evil in you and at the same time laying at God's feet everything that's good. And so where you notice sin at work in you, where you see greed and, and pride and that kind of thing, uh, unrighteous anger at work, uh, where uh, you uh, are tempted to get what you want at the cost of, of whatever is right in all of the different ways that you see sinful longings at work in your heart. Well, he's saying, put all of that to death. And then on the other hand, all the, the blessings that God has given you, the skills, the abilities. Did you notice that in our reading? It talked about all of these different things, these different spiritual gifts that people have that have been given to you by the Holy Spirit. Well, use that all in service to God for his glory. Now, here's the problem that we run into, though. Someone has pointed out that a sacrifice that's a living sacrifice might choose to crawl off the altar. And what that's getting at is this temptation that we always face in our lives of really wanting to rule our own lives rather than sacrificially submitting to the rule of God over us. Ed Rasnicki has written a study of the book of Romans. And one of the things that he points out, an illustration that I think is a little bit helpful for me at least, is that he says we tend to treat the reign of Christ over us as being similar to the role of the Queen of England in governing uh, her nation. So you think about, you know, what's the form of government that they have over in England? Well, they have a parliamentary form of government, but they also have what's called a constitutional monarchy. And so parliament uh, comes up with some kind of law, they, they write it up in a bill, and then what do they do with it? Well, they send it over to Buckingham Palace and let the Queen take a look at it. And, uh, and her signature uh, gives her approval to that, that law that's, that's being passed. Well, what if she doesn't sign it? What, what if she doesn't approve of it? Well, uh, it can still become law anyway, because the queen is not really the one who's ruling the nation. It, it's really parliament working together with the prime minister. They're the ones who are making and passing the laws. And really, it turns out that the queen's a signature is just a polite and a ceremonial nod to tradition when it comes down to it. And that's why it's been since 1707 that whoever was ruling England as the king or the queen didn't sign a law that was sent over. That's over 300 years. Well, that, that's the kind of role that we sometimes are tempted to relegate to God. Probably if I would ask anyone here, you'd say, yeah, God is, of course, the king. God rules all things. But then in our sin, the position that we, we really want God to take is one where we make the decisions and then ask him to uh, sign on and to give his approval of them. And if he does, great. But if he doesn't, well, in our sin, what we do is we say, well, I'm just going to do what I want anyway. Here's the problem with that. God is not a constitutional monarch. 
God's an absolute monarch. And God isn't saying to us, well, you know, I'll go along with whatever you want. God says to us, what I want you to do is I want you to align your will with me, with mine. And more than that, he wants us to do it gladly, sacrificially submitting ourselves and all that we are to him. So a life that's lived like that, such a life is going to be a life lived in nonconformity to this world's values. And that's the second point. Our text says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, just a little bit later in the chapter, and this was, uh, it's actually going to be a part of our epistle next week, but I'm going to jump ahead to that right now, picking it up at verse 9. I want to skim over some of the verses, because what Paul is telling us there is, here's what the sacrificial life looks like. For us, If we would ask God, well, Lord, okay, I want to offer myself as a living sacrifice. What does that look like? Well, here's what God says. Love must be sincere. Uh, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Jumping down to verse 13, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Then verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Verse 17, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 19, don't take revenge, my friends. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Now, as we, as we look over those verses, there's some things that, that ought to jump out of them at us. So first, if I ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do to offer my life is a living sacrifice. God's answer, did you notice this? Is what I want you to do is, is I want you to sacrifice yourself for others. So if I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice to God, God's answer as to what that looks like is this. He says, well, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why you get these statements like, be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves and share with God's people as they have need and so on. Th this is really putting into practice something that Jesus said. And you'll likely remember this. It's, it's found among other places in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 22. And this guy comes up to Jesus and asks him, what's the greatest commandment? Remember that? And Jesus' answer is, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, in all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then he doesn't stop there. He says this. He says, a second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's what stood out to me about this. And it's, it's not that I haven't read this or heard this before, but, but more than any, any other time that I've reflected on this, Notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say, here's the first and the greatest commandment. Now let's move on a little bit lower on down the line to the, to the second, not quite so great commandment. He doesn't say that. He says, here's the first and the greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And then he says, a second one is like it. It's like he puts them right up there next to each other. Love your neighbors yourself. Well, that's actually what he does in the Ten Commandments, doesn't he? He talks about our relationship with him. She'll have no other gods and, and remembering the Sabbath day and, and uh, using God's name as it should be used. But then it moves right on into how should we live with one another in this life in which God has placed us. So, so they come together, the love of God and the love of neighbor. Now, the other thing that stands out is how unlike the world's mindset, what God is calling us to turns out to be. Because notice, he doesn't just talk about, you know, loving one another in the family of God. He does talk about that, but that's not all he says. Because he goes on to say things like this, bless those who persecute you. And he says, don't repay evil for evil. And he says, if your enemy is hungry, well, feed your enemy. And if, if he's thirsty, then give him something to drink. I was listening to a podcast the other day. And they noted on it that in this life, the way that we're really conditioned to think. In fact, it's just the natural default position of our hearts is, is we are set to operate transactionally. I mean, just think of all the transactions you make in life, one after another, in, in your work, right? You, you, you work well, you get paid. Um, you, you don't work so well, you might get fired. 
you, you think of uh, the, the whole system of you going to school and getting grades. Hey, I'm not, I'm not against all of that. I like to be paid. Uh, I, I like to make sure that whoever it is that's, that's uh, say, my medical doctor is somebody who's gotten good grades. They know what they're doing. There, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. The, the problem is that not only do we operate transactionally in that realm of life, not only do we tend to say, okay, um, you do this and then I'll do that, but then we work it like this. And if you uh, do this thing to me that's not so nice, well, then I'll get my revenge. So yeah, you do for me, I'll do for you. But if you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. And that's just the natural way that people act. You ever, you ever seen kids play? You know, that's why as kids are growing up, you, you teach them, hey, if uh, somebody hits you, actually what I would rather have you do is not hit them back. Right? Think of all the times as parents, you say that kind of thing to kids when they're growing up. God is calling us to something else. He's calling us to be transformed from, from this way of thinking. He's calling us to live not transactionally, really. He's calling us to live sacrificially. So when you think about that, you know, how good are you and I at living sacrificially? Well, the way it strikes me is I'm a long way from measuring up to that kind of sacrificial life. There's a lot of room in my life that still needs to be transformed. There's still a lot about my mind that needs renewing. There's a lot of room for repenting. And that really is the kind of transformation that Paul is calling us to in our text here today. So what Paul wants us to understand is that the kind of life that God is calling us to is not one that simply results from trying harder and harder to be sacrificial. That doesn't mean don't try to be sacrificial. Indeed, we should strive to, to do so. But realize this, that our hearts and our minds can only be transformed by the mercies of God. And that's why Paul began this whole section back in verse 1, chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's the foundation of the sacrificial life. The mercy of God in which we actually see God sacrificing himself for us. There's the third point. That living is a sacrifice really means living in the mercy of Jesus. Which means recognizing that you are someone and I am someone who needs that mercy. If you think about the book of Romans, if you think back to the, the book as a whole, the whole first part of the whole opening chapters of the book are all aimed at helping us see how far short of the glory of God we have fallen. It's in Romans that we get these statements, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? No one is righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.10. Were it not for God's mercy, the fact of the matter is, we'd all be lost. Because we haven't measured up. We haven't been as sacrificial as we have been called to be, either in offering ourselves to God or in loving our neighbor. But God has been merciful to us. And he's been merciful through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, who in the most powerful act of sacrifice in the entire history of the universe, gave himself for our salvation, for all the ways that our minds and our bodies have indulged in sin. And all who trust this promise of mercy that is given to us in Christ are forgiven. And we're restored to a right relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. And, and we are given the promise of eternal life. And in this mercy, what's happening? Well, transformation is. Because the mercy itself has power in our lives. It calls us to faith and it keeps us in faith. And it keeps changing us and sanctifying us, renewing our hearts and our minds. And so confessing, repenting of our sins, that's how we keep God's mercy in view. That's why we are here today. We're keeping it in view as we hear God's word again, as we reflect on what he says, as we receive the Lord's Supper, as we reflect on our baptisms. What happened there? Well, you've been washed of your sin. We're building our lives on these great promises of God's mercy for us because it's in that mercy that we encounter God's own power at work in us. It saves us. It forgives us. 
it changes us, yeah, bit by bit, but that's what God is doing as he is making our whole life and mind and body a living sacrifice that through Jesus is now acceptable in the sight of God. In whose name we say, amen. I invite you now to rise. May this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. We continue now by confessing our Christian faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. For all who serve in the church, that their service in Christ's name may result in praise and glory of God in the lives of God's people, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who serve in government, that they may pursue righteousness, justice, peace, and unity. And for those who protect us from violence and preserve order, that they may themselves be protected. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For all noble professions, for the flourishing of the arts and music, for favorable weather, fruits of the earth. For those unemployed, the poor, the homeless, the hungry, and all people in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all families and children, single adults and youth, for those who teach and those who learn, that they may advance in wisdom and grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For victims of disaster and for those stricken by illness or infirmity, for the aged and infirm, as well as those in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, for those who grieve the loss of those whom they love and for those who meet with sudden death. Especially we would remember those who have requested our prayers or for whom prayers have been requested. Think of Ron Highland, Becky Mabry, Ron Wiegert, Carol Bracey, Jamie Klein, Matt Smith, Brianna Hoffman, Lauren Streiner, Marilyn Walker, Marjorie Hagedorn. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the work of God's kingdom in this place, for our faithful support of the church and the renewal of our congregational life through the means of grace, for our communion this day upon the life-giving body and blood of Christ and for our growth in grace that we may attain to the full stature of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the safe and healthy birth of Jude Meyer. We pray that you would be with both mother and child. We pray that Jude would grow up uh, to know you and trust you and to live a godly life. Be merciful to us, O Lord. Hear our prayers. Grant to us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be led into all truth and be steadfast in the confession of Christ through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. Today we start with Peter. In our gospel lesson, we hear about um, what we think about Peter. Sinful, prideful, says just what he thinks, um, acts without thinking, often talks without thinking. Peter. You know, the guy that we can relate to. Because we are also sinful, like Peter. We often uh, 
act without thinking or talk without thinking. We often uh, think maybe too well of ourselves. Peter's a guy that, that we understand because we're kind of like him. So what does he get himself into today? Well, today the disciples are, are answering the question, who is Jesus? And uh, they, they tell him that some people say you're this guy and some people say that this is who you are. And, and Jesus says, no, who do you guys say that I am? And I can imagine the disciples standing around and, and kind of looking at each other and going, ooh, who's gonna, who's gonna answer this one? Um, this is a hard question. Oh no, Peter, he says exactly what he's thinking. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he was right. He got it. He nailed it. I can imagine Jesus giving him a high five and saying, yeah, that's it. Uh, it does record that, that Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah. And then he says, you are Peter, which means rock. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. Well, that's kind of cool. Peter, sinful Peter, Peter, who, uh, you know, often I, I say, puts his foot in his mouth by saying something dumb. Peter is called the first rock that the church is built on. Not because he's good, not because he's perfect. No, not at all. But because he knows who Jesus is. And Jesus has continued to build that church with the saints over the year, with, with sinners who, who aren't righteous, who aren't pure, who aren't perfect, but who know that Jesus is their king and that Jesus is the one who saves them. And that church goes all the way down to, to you and to me. We are also the, the rocks that build the church because we know Jesus, not because we're perfect, not because we're great, but because we know Jesus is our king and he is our savior. And so we hear about this, this kingdom of God that continues to be built, the church. Peter was the first rock, you and I are rocks, a part of this great kingdom. But you hear in this passage, there's this second power, or this second kingdom. This kingdom is, it says the kingdom, uh, or the, it talks about the gates of hell, uh, but also we can look at that as the kingdom of death. Yikes. Um, we think about death often, well, because people we know will die, and someday we'll die too. But what we hear about the kingdom of death today is that our king, oh, he's protecting us from that kingdom. No, the, our king will, will save us from the kingdom of death. No, someday we will die, but we will rise from the dead. We will come right out of the gates of the kingdom of death, and we will come right back into God's kingdom to be with him, to live with him forever. God is our king, and he is our savior. So who do we say that God is? Who do we say that Jesus is? Well, he is... With the church, we say that he is our king, our savior, and the only one who can give us life forever. Will you pray with me? Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus, our king and our savior. In his name we pray. Amen.